So I drew up this chart to try to show how the pharmaceuticals companies and insurance companies are actually practicing medicine without a license and killing people in the process. So you've got pharmaceutical companies at the top and the insurance companies, and you've got doctors at the bottom. Well, they would love to be able to tell doctors how to practice medicine, uh, but that would be too obvious. Um, so they want to be able to control treatment indirectly, and they do it through treatment guidelines. So they can just point to the treatment guidelines and say, hey, you doctors are supposed to be doing this. It's a way to keep them in line. But even that's a little bit obvious. So this is a so-called third-party mechanism for doing this. They fund so-called third-party groups, and they develop the treatment guidelines. Now, this is a quote by Teresa Fricatus, who's an MD and a nun. She says that uh, pharmaceutical companies in the US have begun to develop a parallel strategy meant to manipulate public opinion. They promote organizations that appear to be spontaneous initiatives, but they are in reality supported and run by citizens that work for the pharmaceuticals companies. So this is a very elegant summary of the, uh, the situation we're in. So these third party groups include nonprofits, medical societies such as the IDSA, the AMA, and various thought leaders are associated with them. And they're also uh, dominating the so-called medical education and communications companies that uh, educate doctors. So these medical societies and their thought leaders come up with the treatment guidelines and they also control the continuing education. So this allows the pharmaceuticals and insurance companies to practice medicine without a license, but they do it from behind the scenes so it's not quite so obvious. And they do it in a way that uh, restrict clinical discretion, according to Richard Wolfram, they limit, if not eliminate, choice in the marketplace for medical treatment. So this allows the pharmaceuticals and insurance companies to treat, to dictate to doctors how they can treat patients and, and subsequently make, make a lot of money. So this is an article just showing that these so-called advisors uh, have major conflicts of interest. This is the great swine flu scam from several years back. Uh, the New York Times had an article that showed that um, most of the experts who served on the advisory panels had conflict of interest. And this is a British article showing the same thing. It said a third of the experts to the World Health Organization uh, were consulting on the swine flu pandemic and they had ties to drug firms. They stated that um, this revelation will prompt speculation that the pandemic was wildly, wildly overestimated and largely fueled by, fueled by the drugs industry who stood to benefit from the panic, um, which I believe is right. But they're also create, actually creating legitimate pandemics to justify vaccines. Uh, this is just a article from the New England Journal of Medicine showing that the uh, swine flu epidemic itself uh, may have had a laboratory source. Um, there are actually several articles that show that the swine flu may have come from various laboratories. So Lyme disease is all about mandating symptom treatment and marketing a vaccine. The treatment guidelines facilitate this process by orchestrating a pandemic while under treating and monitoring the underlying infection. And again, this is being done under the secrecy provided by the national security infrastructure. This is what I propose is going on, that you have exposure to the pathogen, either accidental or deliberate, and you prevent treatment, uh, monitor the immune response, develop various uh, methods and organism, or organisms to elicit an immune response in the form of a vaccine. You can test it on increasingly large populations. And this also helps market the disease. And uh, what I think is going to happen is at the end, they're going to su suddenly admit that we have this catastrophic epidemic. And oh, by the way, we just happen to have this vaccine that now looks reasonable by comparison. So again, who would have the power to do this? It's the EIS, who has many uh, other graduates at the very top of the medical health infrastructure. Enabling mythology is the so-called hard to catch and easy to cure mythology. This is a New York Times article where they actually state that Lyme disease can easily be stopped in its tracks with a single dose of antibiotic. Like this quote down here, this is reassuring information for people who make decisions based on evidence. Um, how many diseases can be stopped in their tracks with a single dose of antibiotic, let alone one as complex as Lyme disease, which is one of the most complex infections in the world. So I ask, is any statement too absurd for these establishment Lyme experts? Apparently not. Just a uh, quote on how complex the Lyme disease spirochete is. 
Uh, because of the quantity of the DNA it carries, it enables it to evade detection and it actually attack the immune system. It can also completely change form, becoming a treatment-resistant cyst, as I mentioned earlier. It can shed its outer coat to enter your cells and set up shop. Again, this is an article uh, describing the cystic forms of Borrelia burgdorferi, which helps it resist uh, antibiotics. So it can transform from a modal, modal spirochete into a non-modal cystic form and then reconvert to wreak havoc later on. This is why it's relapsing. So this is just uh, kind of an overview of, back up here, the mythology versus the reality. You have the mythology, the hard to catch, easy to cure philosophy. The reality is that Lyme disease is actually easy to catch and very difficult to cure. So hard to catch, easy to cure is a dream world set up by the pharmaceutical insurance companies who profit from not treating the underlying infection. And it's enabled by the uh, government agencies that are basically captive to these corporations and the medical si societies and medical journals. They're technical and ideological enablers. And under them, you have these Ivy League, doc Ivy League doctors, the thought leaders, and they're basically tobacco scientists, in my opinion. And they come up with the treatment guidelines that make life a nightmare for doctors and patients who are trying to treat Lyme disease. Uh, by controlling the doctors, they can prevent patients from being treated and monitor their systematic deterioration, develop vaccines, allow the infection to spread, and then create a market for these vaccines. Again, I'm sorry, if you have the, EI, the EIS at every critical node, as Elena Cook says, this enables them to do it. Uh, this is all, again, summarized on uh, my website, Winston Smith Speaks. Again, uh, got this epidemic growing faster than AIDS, and there's absolutely nothing being done about it. Uh, there's an article showing that from 1991, nationwide, uh, Lyme cases have doubled. In some cases, just within the last couple of years, like in Massachusetts, et cetera, you actually have doubling of, uh, or you have 50% increases in one year. And again, in uh, Connecticut, you only have 2% of the uh, doctors are actually treating Lyme because many of the doctors are being systematically knocked out. 